Celeb Savant is a career retrospective type interview focusing on singers, actors and industry experts. Join Barrett Edelstein now as he dives into the entertainment world. Rory Petzer has become one of South Africa's most prolific comedians and content creators. This guy pops up everywhere, from national talk radio to news features, social media feeds, and international online news publications. Having recently taken his one-man show across the country, Rory has been performing at sold-out venues in major cities from Cape Town to Josie to small towns like Hermanus and everywhere in between. In 2023, Rory won the most uplifting comedic content at the Savannah Comics Choice Comedy Awards. Known for his wit and observational humor, he's become the country's official, unofficial hype man and cheerleader. He took South Africans all over the world through the Rugby and Cricket World Cups in 2023, as well as AFCON in 2024, with his hilarious content inspiring Saffirs everywhere to get behind their teams. Up next on Slab Savant, we've got Rory Petzer. Where in the world are you and how are you doing? I'm currently sitting in a meeting room at East Coast Radio in Durban, and I'm doing absolutely fantastically. Thank you. It's great, great to be on your podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining. Were you there as a guest or are you full-time at East Coast Radio? No, full-time. Yeah, I'm a producer here. Yeah. So I produced the 9 to 12 show with Carol Lafori, the best show on the station. Probably one of the best shows in the country, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I do here, yeah, 9 to 12. I usually leave here yeah, around 12, half past 1, 2, depending on how much work I have. Mm. Get out about eight, half past 8. And then um, at the moment, after that, I will go and lecture at Boston Media House. I lecture third-year students there in radio. So that, that takes place from 2 to 5. And then in the other times, I'm just writing silly jokes and recording funny videos. Okay, so now there are multiple avenues that I would like to discuss. So let's start off and from the beginning. At what age, whether as a child or teenager, did you decide, cool, you want to be in the entertainment world, in production, in comedy, and, and leading in, obviously, that sprung into lecturing. So what age and how did that journey progress to where we are today? Okay, so that's a very good story, actually. So I was 12 years old, and I was living in Port Elizabeth, because that's where I grew up, Roberta, and I won a competition on the radio on a Radio will go then. It was so I'll go with him now, but it was Radio will go with then. Mm -hmm. To join the breakfast show host, Darren Mann, to go to Joburg for Red Nose Day. And then the 12 people from all around the country, all different stations around the country, you all get a key. And you have to open up a house. If your key opens the mini little house, you win the house. It's in Cape Town, blah, blah, blah. All very exciting. I didn't win the house. I was 12 or 13 years old. Um, I didn't win the house. But on that trip, Darren Mann said to me, he said, Rory, if you want to have like lots of fun and like make okay money to survive, get into radio. I was like young and impressionable, 12 years old. I want to be in radio. I went to her mom, dad, I want to be in radio. They're like, no, oh, Rory, whatever, do what you can. I'm like, no, Darren said it's awesome. I said, yes, yes, Rory, well done. I'm like, no, I want to get into radio. So then from then, the seed was planted. I want to get into radio, entertainment, media. And I carried on, carried on, carried on. And then fast forward like 15 years later, I became a sports presenter at Algo FM. And Darren Mann was still there, by the way. This, this presenter was still there. And then fast forward two years later, I became Darren Mann's producer on The Breakfast Show. The same guy who told me like 20 years ago. Yeah. And I told him, I said, Darren, do you remember meeting me? He's like, no, when did I meet you? And I told him, he's like, oh, you were that little guy. I said, yes. Do you remember what you said to me, Darren? He's like, what did I say to you? You said to me, Rory, if you want to have fun and have like, okay, money, get into radio. He's like, did I say that? I'm so sorry. I must have been drunk or hungover because that's a bad, <laughs> that's bad life advice. I was like, no. And then from you telling me that when I was 12, that was my goal. And like now literally... I became his producer like 15 years. It's a crazy story and it's, I can't believe it's real. It's like, it's crazy. And I can remember as a 12 year old sitting in the car driving to the airport, I can remember him clearly saying that to me so clear in my head. Yes. Such a good story. I don't remember saying that at all. I said, it's funny how you say things to people yes. you forget and they will remember for the rest of their life. Yeah, yeah. I'll still remember. And here I am basically. And then I got into radio and then radio and then entertainment media. Then I was like, okay, well, let's try to do comedy as well. I um, got drunk one night. Someone talked me into doing a comedy night. I was like, why not? Let's do it month later, I did it. And then that was exactly 10 years ago, the comedy. And then here we are, 10 years later, still loving it, still loving radio, still loving comedy. Let's go into the different avenues. What does it mean to be a producer on a radio show? What does it mean to be a producer on a radio show? That is a good question. So producer, we organize the interviews, we organize the content, we gather information that is needed. 
So I'm lucky in that my, my presenter also contributes towards the content. So in some cases, producers, they work alone. Like they must go home now and then do all the content for the next show all on their own. But yes. I'm lucky, my presenter, we do content together. So it's basically a collaborative effort. Basically, you collab on a radio show with, with someone else in the ideal world. So I'll put the content together. I'll put the document together. So mm. interestingly, we have a live document and then Carol sits in the studio on air and I sit here and I update it, updates live that. So basically, we're just working together, putting the radio show together, organizing interviews. If there's an outside broadcast, making sure that the interview person is there. Just basically putting things together for the show to make it happen. It's lots of fun. I enjoy it. How long have you been a producer for this specific show? For this show, producer for this show, four years. The okay. Four years, four years. Yeah, four years. And previously to that, you were on which show? Uh, previous to that, I was producing a drive show at East Coast Radio. And previous to that, I was producing the breakfast show at Algo FM. So how does it work? So you mentioned you were previously dr- producing a drive show. So mm-hmm. what changes that then leads you to now produce the morning show? Okay, so what happens is every few years or every so often radio shows are, are refreshed and then Different people come on, different presenters come on. So I was part of a team that did the drive show, and that team was completely disbanded when the when when the presenters left. And they built a whole new team from scratch. It was, oh well, Rory isn't the right person for this team. Let's find someone else for that team. Rory's the right person for this time. So it's okay. basically like courses for courses, really. Okay, understood. Yeah. Okay, now let's dive. You said that you've been doing comedy for ten years after a drunken agreement or hungover agreement yes. to do. <laughs> yes. So it's crazy. What do you enjoy about doing stand-up comedy? For me, the best part about doing stand-up comedy is, especially in South Africa, and um, I'm known for bringing light, especially when it's dark, especially when there was load shedding and all that. We haven't had load shedding in a while, which is very suspicious, actually. But <laughs> I, I like to remind, I like to remind South Africans that, like, as much as there is so much drama and cuck and all that stuff, there is so much good in this country, and we are yes. such good people. When exactly. we all come together, it's fantastic. And when I thrive on events that South Africa have or host. So Rugby World Cup last year, AFCON last year, Cricket World Cup, T20 Cricket World Cup. I, I thrive when I see South Africans coming together for a good cause. And I just love it. I think loving comedy and lo- loving being South African is the same thing for me. Like there are so many opportunities here for us to laugh at ourselves that mm. and I see all of them every day. And I just like to remind South Africans all the time that as much as there's so much darkness and cuck, there's so much happiness. We're great people. There's lots to laugh at. Let's look at the funny side of something and then deal with the drama later. Yes, this is cuck that this happened, but you know what? There's also a funny side, yeah. So when the lights go out, whatever's cuck, there's no lights, there's drama. But you know, there's also a funny side to it. Whatever the funny side, I will find it and I'll record it in a little video in my car and then put it out there. Um, yeah, I just love, I love making light of dark places. What's the difference for you between headlining your own show and then doing a show where it's like multiple uh, comedians, one after the next? I've branched into the last year and a bit doing only my own shows. Okay. And the reason it's better for me personally to do my own show is that when I get to the venue and it's my own show, these people are yeah because they love me and they want yes. to see me. Yeah. They're not yeah because there's 11 comedians and them two might like this one, three might like the government of national unity. It's the, the audience is yeah because they want Rory. And it's much better performing to an audience who is there especially to see you. It's just... The room feels better. The energy is better. When you go to a room with 11 other comedians, it's just like, who are these people really here to see? You learn yeah. a lot. But for me, it's better in the space that I'm in right now. After doing 10 years of comedy, I like going to a room confident that these people bought tickets just to see me and yeah. they're here for comedy. Okay. So I'm not going to do my 10 minutes of comedy and might get lost on some people. Like, I'm going to put together a solid hour of comedy and they're here to watch me do that. And that's why they're here. It's much better for me. And how long does it take you to prepare that hour of comedy? Well, that's a very good question. So an hour of comedy takes years and years and years to prepare because you're doing con- different content all the time. You're trying different content all the time. And then some things work, some things don't. So every comedy show I do, I record it on my phone, a voice recorded. And then the next morning I listen back because you think, oh, I, s- I smashed it last night. Everyone laughed all the time. And you listen back you're like, no, they didn't. They were <laughs> laughing like four times. Like maybe in your head you were loving it. And you listen back and you're like, okay, that joke worked. That and I, oh, I did a one liner there that I didn't plan. It really worked. Let me save this one liner over here and use it again. So it's a work in progress. My my comedy sets, as much as they will be sort of the same when you work on one hour, they're never exactly the same. There's always other stuff that you throw in there. Yes, and then you develop it into another another angle, another angle, another angle. So it's not an easy question to answer. 
it takes years and years and years of like different ideas and different concepts to put a thing together and then you sort of work around that and you mold it. So it takes a long time, a long time of practice and people who start comedy now and they go, oh, I'm going to be rich and famous and do comedy in a year's time. No, you're not. Like you're not going to be anything near. Like this thing takes a long, long time. I think Dave Chappelle, one of the big comedians, he said even after 10 years, it finally started to click. And I can completely relate to that. After doing 10 years, only now is it like, oh, that's how, that's, what, that's how it works, this whole thing. So it takes a long time to finally find, find yourself and find your group. Because also in the beginning, when you're doing comedy, you watch a lot of other comedians and you try and be like them. And it's the biggest fail in the world trying yes. to be like someone else. Because you're not that person. Like Ricky Gervais, my favorite comedian in the world. I want to be like him. No, Ricky Gervais's jokes do not land in South Africa very well. Like it's nice. He's funny where he is and it's great to idolize him and all that. But you're not, you're not him. Like, yeah. Don't. And I made that mistake for the first few years. Like, I want to be like this guy. Like, no, no, no. No, Have you are you. Yes. You're Rory. So it's interesting yes. because when I first started Slab Savant, so many people say to me, okay, I must watch this person or this person or how they do yeah. that. And I, at the beginning, said no. Because no. I'm very much a person that when I watch something and I'm doing something in sort of in the same vein, I start doubting in the past. I've learned now. In the past, I'd start doubting my authenticity and who I am. And I'd be yes. like, okay, well, now I need to emulate that, but that's not who I am. So it doesn't 100%. work. And then if yeah. people don't enjoy it. So from the beginning, I decided, no, I'm not watching anyone else. I'm just doing me. And that's yeah. allowed for the success of the show. Do you do audience work? Yes, I do quite a lot of audience work. I love doing audience work because okay. it also breaks away from your normal routine. So you have like, let's say, a 60-minute set, but then you do it sometimes and it takes an hour and 20 minutes. You're like, why did I take, oh, because I spoke to that person, that person. I love doing audience work. Also makes people feel part of the room. I never rip people off though. I'm not a person who like teases people. They didn't come there to be ripped off and yeah. be teased. I'll just talk to people like, oh, where do you work? Oh, where are you from? And oh, okay. try and make it funny. Without, yes. without, without belittling the people. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Belittle, they didn't come there to be, a lot of comedians will belittle the audience. Like, no, just ostracize yourself. You make it like us and them then. It's not us and them. Yes. We are in this room together, laughing together. So I do a lot of audience work. I enjoy talking to the audience, getting to know who's in the room. Like, who's here? Where are you from? What do you do for a living? Let's, because you know me now. I want to know you as well, basically. So I do a lot of that. Obviously, comedians need to have be able to read the energy of the room and read the people and how things are going. Yes. I know already, you already mentioned that it ta- took 10 years yeah. for you. It's now starting to click in. The reading of the energy of the room, is that something that came naturally to you or is it something that you developed over time? No, I think it comes naturally to me. Like if, if I walk into a room, I can feel the mood and what, what the vibe is. I don't think I've taught myself that. Or maybe I did, actually. I don't know. But I think it came naturally. Like, I think it's something I've picked up, I've just always had. And if I walk into a room, often if it's, especially when it's a lineup show, I can walk in and think, oh, this is not going to be nice. I can just feel, but then you also psych yourself out. Yes, so exactly. Yeah. I don't like to read too much into that. Like, the energy of the room is how you make it. So, like, when you walk in yeah. there, if you're feeling confident and happy, because I mean, this is a terrifying thing to do every single time. It doesn't matter how long you're doing comedy for, it is as terrifying as the first time you did it every single time. I worked a lot with Barry Hilton. The last few years, and even the ones backstage with him, you're sitting there going, Oh, I hate this party. This is so, I hate it. I just want to get out there. Like, I just want to get out there. And I said, Are you nervous? He goes, I'm terrified. But are you nervous? I said, Yeah. He goes, Good. Never stop being nervous. Because when you stop being nervous, it means you don't care about it. Just yes. always be nervous. I was like, Someone like Barry Hilton, 40 years in the industry, still gets nervous. So even though you can read the room or not, those nerves, you can walk in the room and think, Hey, this is a fantastic room. It's going to be great. And then, No. So you mentioned that your act is always being tweaked. But yes. how often do you actually completely throw everything out and create from scratch? Or is it the foundation or is there and you're building and tweaking and building and tweaking? Uh, so you're usually building and tweaking, building and tweaking. And because you're always building and tweaking, as you tweak, because you want to do 60 minutes, often stuff just gets thrown out automatically. Like that'll go, that'll go. It's like a, a pr- process of elimination and editing that st- stuff leaves and stuff goes. Because sometimes, I mean, any comedian will tell you, they'll have one or two jokes or stories that they do that they've been doing for 10 years because they always just work perfectly. So you'll have those stock standards that you do. Yeah. And um, even if you do a venue, the people will say, please tell that story about that thing that you told last time. Like, that's interesting because you've heard the story. Why do you want to hear it again? Yeah. I yeah. want to hear that same story because like I brought my friend here to hear the story. And so I've never, I've never actually taken a whole thing and gone, you've gone, let's start a new one. 
I eliminate as I go. I'm like, okay, that's boring now. I'm sick of that. That's boring. I'm doing this, and I add on new stuff onto it. So yeah. it's not a case of throwing bring back. It's just a case yeah. of let's, yeah, let's just sprinkle around it, get rid of that. Okay, put some new stuff in, and over time, eventually, you will have a whole new sixty minutes. For exactly. me, it's a process. I don't just eliminate. It's, like a conscious, just... it's like a, a it's not a conscious thing. Okay, scrap start. It's like yes. it's a yes. slow build and elimination. Yes. And some comedians do it differently. Some comedians, maybe every year they'll write, they'll, they'll disappear for a month and write a whole new thing. But it's difficult because then you also need to test your material on people. So I just like to do it slowly but surely. Yeah. To always know that I've got something. When you agreed to do that, that comedy yes. thing 10 years ago is a hangover agreement. Did you yes. think, okay, cool, this is an avenue that's going to open for me. I am funny. Or did you just think, okay, cool, I'm just doing this as a sort of a dare from when that person and it's going to be one night thing and that's it? No, so a bit of both. I've always wanted to do this comedy thing for a long, long time since I was a kid. Like, I want to be funny on a stage, but I don't know how to do it. And then at Algo FM, one of the people there organized the comedy show. No, he wouldn't organize it. Someone organized it and someone else from Algo FM decided to be the guest act. First time doing comedy. Went and watched. I was like, that was fantastic, whatever. Then the organizer said, Rory, you work at Algo. Why don't you do it next month? I was like, yes, sure. Sign me up. I'll do it. I'm funny. <laughs> the next morning, I was like, what the hell have I agreed to do? And I was like, no, Rory, but you should actually do this. Like, you're funny. You must do it. It's like, no, there's so much pressure. And then my first few gigs, I was shameless. I would go up onto the stage with a piece of paper that I had all my jokes on. So in case I forgot them, I'd be like, oh, let me tell you a story about this. And I'll tell a story. And like, oh, let me tell you. So for the first year, at least, I was being so basic. I had a piece of paper with me or I had it on the floor somewhere or like, or just shameless in my hand sometimes. And then I was like, I don't know how to do this without having paper. So now every show, even to this day, when I do a show anywhere, even if I'm doing the same set I did the previous night, I will write the whole thing out again. I'll have it in my back pocket just as a security. As like, okay. Okay. It'll sit in my back pocket. So I think if the moment happens that I go blank, I can just take it out. I never needed to take it out, but it's just there as a crutch. Like, I don't know if anything happens, I just go blank. I've got that piece of paper there. Yes. I can go there. But Joe, when I first started doing this thing, when I agreed to do it, I had a 50-50, like, hey, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can't. Let's just go try it. But I didn't think that 10 years later, I will still be doing it. I didn't think that was going to be a thing. Okay. Like, it's going to just be like a hobby I'll do for a few months. If you think of in the entertainment world, obviously singers have got bands and they say doing um, uh, acoustic, you know, concerts yes. there, theater, yes. um, unless it's a one-person show is a whole ensemble. So comedy is generally a standalone by yourself, yeah. encompassing the whole energy of the stage. How do you maintain energy and balance to create that energy for the entire period of time? Sometimes it goes by so quickly that you don't even know how it happens. And sometimes it takes really, really long, depending on, on, on how you're doing. And I think the audience mirrors you. So that one of the first things I learned when I was doing comedy is if you go into the room feeling nervous and anxious, the audience is going to feed off that. So yeah. whether just go in there and just feel confident and the energy you exude is the energy they're going to also absorb and like they're going to take. It should be a long time to learn that. Like don't be anxious, don't be nervous. When you walk out there, you're nervous. The audience is also like almost like cringing with you. Like this is, this is not a nice experience for anyone. So I try like before I go on stage, I'll try and be like shake around like, ah, oh, this is fantastic. Like jump around and stuff. And then go out with like, just like, ah, happy. And then when you <laughs> and I always have a song that plays loud and then you're like, you start the energy right. And it just, as you talk, as you go, as you go, you're like, okay, this is nice. It takes a while. For me, it takes about two minutes before I feel completely comfortable. But when I do feel comfortable, then I'm like, okay, now we can do this for days. Like I've got yeah. stories for you guys. I'm going to tell you stories for decades. Hope you're comfortable. <laughs> okay, so now let's go into your other stage. You lecture in at Boston City Campus and you lecture in radio. Yes. Third year radio students, yeah. So what does that mean when you say you lecture radio? What is it? So basically I teach the students based on their syllabus, Boston syllabus, um, how radio works, how radio show works, how to put a radio show together from a content perspective, how to put a radio together from a clock perspective. Like each hour you have news, traffic, you have sports, then you have three songs, then you have adverts, then you have two songs. So help them put the show together physically. Then we go to the studio and we put the show together practically as well so we sit there and we record shows once a week record a three-hour show i crit them on the content i crit them on the de um, delivery of it so it's basically taking people well they're third years they do know stuff about radio it's taking second years into the working space that's the bridge like you have a second year now after third year you can go into the radio world so i basically 
teach them everything they need to know about entering the radio world professionally. Like you've, you, you know the basics now, you know the theory. Let's learn the practical stuff about it. Let's learn how to put the microphone on and how to talk to an audience. That's basically it. It's so much fun. And how long have you been doing that? Been doing that now for uh, five years. How did that journey happen? I used to lecture in Port Elizabeth as well back in the day. I lectured uh, journalism students and at Varsity College. And then while I was working here, Boston City Campus contacted me and said, yeah, we know you lectured before. We have an opening for a third-year lecturer for radio. I was like, this is not a door I was planning to ever open again. But interesting. I did enjoy doing it. I wonder, let me try this thing again. And then I got into it again, and I'm absolutely loving it. It wasn't something I'd planned to do. Like I thought when I left PE and Boston, Boston College, I was like, okay, lecturing's done. Didn't think about it ever again. And then they approached me. I was like, wait, I used to be a lecturer. I clean forgot about that. This is an avenue I can open again. It was really fun. So it's just something that I really enjoy doing. And I forgot that I was doing it, or that I did it previously. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, now I'm doing it again. It's great. And you only lecture third years? Only third years, yeah. Okay. So it's, lecturing times is three days a week, two to five, two o'clock to five o'clock. Are you lecturing for that full period, two to five, those full yes, three hours? Yeah, yes. And is it tiring? exhausting because basically you're performing yes. it's basically performance. you're performing to these students so that's exhausting it's really tiring like so it's different to comedy because the comedy is about your act whatever and then it's over yes but i suppose with lecturing you have to impart knowledge and hoping that those people receiving the knowledge are in absorbing yes. it taking it in and then working yes. with it so you have to give that extra energy over and above totally. compared to production or comedy because you have to empower them at the same time yes and that leaves their remembering stuff so my trick is i'm just trying to make it as funny as possible as entertaining as possible so we don't take it too seriously i'll just make it fun that that's that's what i do because i, I think of myself as a student i don't be sitting there staring at a powerpoint and someone <laughs> reading the point to me there's nothing worse yeah so i make it interactive and fun yeah so it's not so i enjoy doing it because it's fun and interactive with them as well so as much as it's exhausting at the time it's not only afterwards it's like oh you get in your car like jeez your yeah. voice feels tired, like, but no, that's fun. I love it. Now, so I know if I had to ask you this question in two minutes, two years, I know, or 20 minutes, I know your answer will be different every time simply because there are many yeah. of them. But in this moment of time, three comedians that you have been inspired by, that you enjoy watching, that you enjoy listening to, who are those three at this moment in time? At this moment right now, um, Ricky Gervais, definitely. Barry Hilton, and then from a local South African point of view, there's a Durban guy, Carvin Goldstone, and I work with him as well sometimes. So locally, Carvin Goldstone, I really love his stuff. I learned a lot from just watching him and working with him. And then Barry Hilton, of course, because he also mentored me, mentors me still. I can phone him anytime and ask him for advice. And then international person that made me want to do comedy was Ricky Gervais. I was like, that guy, I want to be like him. But now, no, I don't want to be like him. I just want to watch him yes. and just appreciate yes. him and appreciate yes. me yeah. so next next you'll um be invited just saying this for the south african television awards or for the summer awards and you'll just rip everyone apart like you did at the golden globes <laughs> yeah, yes wow imagine that was so brave that's one of my best things ever to watch just sitting there wow wow yo epstein is your friend you like jeffrey epstein oh my gosh it was so cringe but so good so brave <laughs> You're going to be so confident about yourself and about your career and about who you are to go there and say all of that and know that you're not going to be cancelled. Like, I'm fine. I'm Ricky Gervais. I'm huge. The podcast is listened to throughout the world. As a final message, what would you like to say? I've always said this for a long time. It's very simple. If you love what you do and do what you love, you'll never work ever. And I'll do that every single day. I love what I do. I do what I love every single minute, every single day. If I don't love something, I'll stop doing it like immediately. If it doesn't bring me joy, I'll stop doing it. You need to find something in your life that brings you so much joy that you'll wake up to do it and want to do it. You might hate your job, but find something that you can do that brings, that gives you that feeling of like, yes, this is fantastic. Yes. I love doing this and I love being alive. We all have those things and some of us forget to do them. Find that thing that makes you love being alive and make sure you do it at least once every single day so you do love being alive. Thank you for listening to this episode of Celeb Savant. Please follow Barrett on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at Celeb Savant. That's C-E-L-E-B-S-A-V-A-N-T.